The Council of Trent, the Twenty-Second Session The Canons and Decrees of the Sacred and Ecumenical Council of Trent Edited and Translated J. Waterworth Session the Twenty-Second Being the Sixth under the Sovereign Pontiff Pius the Fourth Celebrated on the 17th of September, 1562 Doctrine on the Sacrifice of the Mass The Sacred and Holy ecumenical and general synod of Trent, lawfully assembled in the Holy Ghost, the same legates of the apostolic sect presiding therein, to the end that the ancient, complete, and in every part perfect faith and doctrine touching the great mystery of the Eucharist may be retained in the Holy Catholic Church, and may, all errors and heresies being repelled, be preserved in its own purity." The Synod, instructed by the illumination of the Holy Ghost, teaches, declares, and decrees what follows, to be preached to the faithful, on the subject of the Eucharist, considered as being a true and singular sacrifice. CHAPTER One, ON THE INSTITUTION OF THE MOST HOLY SACRIFICE OF THE MASS For as much as, under the former testament, according to the testimony of the Apostle Paul, there was no perfection, because of the weakness of the Levitical priesthood, there was need, God the Father of mercies so ordaining, that another priest should rise, according to the order of Melchizedek, our Lord Jesus Christ, who might consummate and lead to what is perfect, as many as were to be sanctified. He, therefore, our God and Lord, though he was about to offer himself once on the altar of the cross unto God the Father by means of his death, there to operate an eternal redemption. Nevertheless, because that his priesthood was not to be extinguished by his death in the Last Supper, on the night in which he was betrayed, that he might leave to his own beloved spouse the church a visible sacrifice, such as the nature of man requires, whereby that bloody sacrifice, once to be accomplished on the cross, might be represented, and the memory thereof remain even unto the end of the world and its salutary virtue be applied to the remission of those sins which we daily commit. Declaring himself constituted a priest for ever, according to the order of Melchizedek, he offered up to God the Father his own body and blood under the species of bread and wine. And, under the symbols of those same things, he delivered his own body and blood to be received by his apostles, whom he then constituted priests of the New Testament, and by those words, Do this in commemoration of me, he commanded them and their successors in the priesthood to offer them, even as the Catholic Church has always understood and taught. For, having celebrated the ancient Passover, which the multitude of the children of Israel immolated in memory of their going out of Egypt, he instituted the new Passover, to wit, himself to be immolated, under visible signs, by the Church, through the ministry of priests, in memory of his own passage from this world unto the Father, when, by the effusion of his own blood, he redeemed us, and delivered us from the power of darkness, and translated us into his kingdom. And this is indeed that clean oblation which cannot be defiled by any unworthiness or malice of those that offer it, which the Lord foretold by Malachias was to be offered in every place clean to his name, which was to be great amongst the Gentiles and which the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, has not obscurely indicated when he says that they who are defiled by the participation of the table of devils cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord, by the table meaning in both places the altar. This, in fine, is that oblation which was prefigured by various types of sacrifices during the period of nature and of the law, inasmuch as it comprises all the good things signified by those sacrifices as being the consummation and perfection of them all. CHAPTER Two, THAT THE SACRIFICE OF THE MASS IS PROPITIATORY BOTH FOR THE LIVING AND THE DEAD. AND FORASMUCH AS, IN THIS DIVINE SACRIFICE WHICH IS CELEBRATED IN THE MASS, THAT SAME CHRIST IS CONTAINED AND IMMOLATED IN AN UNBLOODY MANNER, who once offered himself in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross. The Holy Synod teaches that this sacrifice is truly propitiatory, and that by means thereof this is effected, that we obtain mercy and find grace in seasonable aid, 
if we draw nigh unto God, contrite and penitent, with a sincere heart and upright faith, with fear and reverence. For the Lord, appeased by the oblation thereof, and granting the grace and gift of penitence, forgives even heinous crimes and sins. For the victim is one and the same, the same now offering by the ministry of priests, who then offered himself on the cross, the manner alone of offering being different. The fruits indeed of which oblation, of that bloody one to wit, are received most plentifully through this unbloody one. So far is this latter from derogating in any way from that former oblation. Wherefore, not only for the sins, punishments, satisfactions, and other necessities of the faithful who are living, but also for those who are departed in Christ, and who are not as yet fully purified, is it rightly offered, agreeably, to a tradition of the apostles. CHAPTER three, ON MASSES IN HONOR OF THE SAINTS And although the Church has been accustomed at times to celebrate certain masses in honor and memory of the saints, not therefore, however, doth she teach that sacrifices offered unto them, but unto God alone who crowned them, whence neither is the priest wont to say, I offer sacrifice to thee, Peter, or Paul. But giving thanks to God for their victories, he implores their patronage, that they may vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we celebrate upon earth. CHAPTER four, ON THE CANON OF THE MASS And whereas it beseemeth that holy things be administered in a holy manner, and of all holy things this sacrifice is the most holy, to the end that it might be worthily and reverently offered and received, the Catholic Church instituted many years ago the sacred canon, so pure from every error, that nothing is contained therein which does not in the highest degree savor of a certain holiness and piety, and raise up unto God the minds of those that offer. For it is composed out of the very words of the Lord, the traditions of the apostles, and the pious institutions also of holy pontiffs. CHAPTER five ON THE SOLEMN CEREMONIES OF THE SACRIFICE OF THE MASS And whereas such is the nature of man, that without external helps he cannot easily be raised to the meditation of divine things, therefore has Holy Mother Church instituted certain rites, to wit, that certain things be pronounced in the Mass in a low, and others in a louder tone. She has likewise employed ceremonies such as mystic benedictions, lights, incense, vestments, and many other things of this kind, derived from an apostolical discipline and tradition, whereby both the majesty of so great a sacrifice might be recommended, and the minds of the faithful be excited by those visible signs of religion and piety, to the contemplation of those most sublime things which are hidden in this sacrifice. CHAPTER six on Mass wherein the priest alone communicates. The sacred and holy synod would fain indeed that at each Mass the faithful who are present should communicate, not only in spiritual desire, but also by the sacramental participation of the Eucharist, that thereby a more abundant fruit might be derived to them from this most holy sacrifice. But not therefore, if this be not always done, does it condemn as private and unlawful, but approves of and therefore commends those masses in which the priest alone communicates sacramentally, since those masses also ought to be considered as truly common, partly because the people communicate spiritually thereat, partly also because they are celebrated by a public minister of the church, not for himself only, but for all the faithful who belong to the body of Christ. CHAPTER seven on the water that is to be mixed with the wine to be offered in the chalice. The Holy Synod notices in the next place that it has been enjoined by the church on priests to mix water with the wine that is to be offered in the chalice, as well because it is believed that Christ the Lord did this, as also because from his side there came out blood and water, the memory of which mystery is renewed by this commixture, and whereas in the Apocalypse of Blessed John the peoples are called waters, the union of that faithful people with Christ, their head is hereby represented. CHAPTER eight, On not celebrating the Mass everywhere in the vulgar tone, the mysteries of the Mass to be explained to the people. Although the Mass contains great instruction for the faithful people, nevertheless it has not seemed expedient to the fathers that it should be everywhere celebrated in the vulgar tongue. 
wherefore the ancient usage of each church and the rite approved of by the holy roman church the mother and mistress of all churches being in each place retained and that the sheep of christ may not suffer hunger nor the little ones ask for bread and there be none to break it unto them the holy synod charges pastors and all who have the cure of souls that they frequently during the celebration of mass expound either by themselves or others some portion of those things which are read at mass and that amongst the rest they explain some mystery of this most holy sacrifice especially on the lord's days and festivals chapter nine preliminary remark on the following canons and because that many errors are at this time disseminated and many things are taught and maintained by diverse persons in opposition to this ancient faith which is based on the sacred gospel the traditions of the apostles and the doctrine of the holy fathers the sacred and holy synod after many and grave deliberations maturely had touching these matters has resolved with the unanimous consent of all the fathers to condemn and to eliminate from holy church by means of the canons subjoined whatsoever is opposed to this most pure faith and sacred doctrine on the sacrifice of the mass canon one if any one saith that in the mass a true and proper sacrifice is not offered to god or that to be offered is nothing else but that Christ is given us to eat, let him be anathema. Canon 2. If any one saith that by those words do this for the commemoration of me, Luke 22.19, Christ did not institute the apostles' priest, or did not ordain that they and other priests should offer his own body and blood, let him be anathema. Canon 3. If any one saith that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, or that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, or that it profits him only who receives, and that it ought not to be offered for the living and the dead for sins, pains, satisfactions, and other necessities, let him be anathema. Canon 4 if any one saith that by the sacrifice of the mass a blasphemy is cast upon the most holy sacrifice of christ consummated on the cross or that it is thereby derogated from let him be anathema canon five if any one saith that it is an imposture to celebrate masses in honour of the saints and for obtaining their intercession with god as the church intends let him be anathema canon six if any one saith that the canon of the Mass contains errors and is therefore to be abrogated, let him be anathema. Canon 7. If any one saith that the ceremonies, vestments, and outward signs which the Catholic Church makes use of in the celebration of Masses are incentives to impiety rather than offices of piety, let him be anathema. Canon 8. If any one saith that masses wherein the priest alone communicates sacramentally are unlawful and are therefore to be abrogated, let him be anathema. Canon 9. If any one saith that the rite of the Roman Church according to which a part of the canon and the words of consecration are pronounced in a low tone is to be condemned, or that the mass ought to be celebrated in the vulgar tongue only, or that the water ought not to be mixed with the wine that is to be offered in the chalice, for that it is contrary to the institution of Christ, let him be anathema. Decree concerning the things to be observed and to be avoided in the celebration of the Mass. What great care is to be taken that the sacred and holy sacrifice of the Mass be celebrated with all religious service and veneration, each one may easily imagine, who considers that in holy writ he is called accursed, who doth the work of God negligently and if we must needs confess that no other work can be performed by the faithful so holy and divine as this tremendous mystery itself, wherein that life-giving victim, by which we were reconciled to the Father, is daily immolated on the altar by priests, it is also sufficiently clear that all industry and diligence is to be applied to this end, that it be performed with the greatest possible inward cleanness and purity of heart, and outward show of devotion and piety. Whereas, therefore, either through the wickedness of the times, or through the carelessness and corruption of men, many things seem already to have crept in which are alien from the dignity of so great a sacrifice, 
to the end that the honor and cult due thereunto may, for the glory of God and the edification of the faithful people, be restored. The Holy Synod decrees that the ordinary bishops of places shall take diligent care and be bound to prohibit and abolish all those things which either covetousness, which is a serving of idols, or irreverence, which can hardly be separated from impiety, or superstition, which is a false imitation of true piety, may have introduced. And that many things may be comprised in a few words. First, as relates to covetousness, they shall wholly prohibit all manner of conditions and bargains for recompenses, and whatsoever is given for the celebration of new masses, as also those importunate and illiberal demands rather than requests for alms, and other things of the like sort, which are but little removed from a simonical taint, or at all events from filthy lucre. In the next place, that irreverence may be avoided, each in his own diocese, shall forbid that any wandering or unknown priest be allowed to celebrate Mass. Furthermore, they shall not allow any one who is publicly and notoriously stained with crime either to minister at the holy altar or to assist at the sacred services, nor shall they suffer the holy sacrifice to be celebrated either by any seculars or regulars whatsoever in private houses, or at all out of the church, and those oratories which are dedicated solely to divine worship, and which are to be designated and visited by the said ordinaries, and not then unless those who are present shall have first shown, by their decently composed outward appearance, that they are there not in body only, but also in mind and devout affection of heart. They shall also banish from churches all those kinds of music, in which, whether by the organ or in the singing, there is mixed up anything lascivious or impure, as also all secular actions, vain and therefore profane conversations, all walking about, noise and clamor, that so the house of God may be seen to be, and may be called, truly a house of prayer. Lastly, that no room may be left for superstition, they shall by ordinance and under given penalties provide that priests do not celebrate at other than due hours, nor employ other rites, or other ceremonies and prayers in the celebration of masses, besides those which have been approved of by the church, and have been received by a frequent and praiseworthy usage. They shall wholly banish from the church the observance of a fixed number of certain masses and candles, as being the invention of superstitious worship rather than of true religion, and they shall instruct the people what is and whence especially is derived the fruit so precious and heavenly of this most holy sacrifice." They shall also admonish their people to repair frequently to their own parish churches, at least on the Lord's days and the greater festivals. All, therefore, that has been briefly enumerated is in such wise propounded to all ordinaries of places as that by the power given them by this sacred and holy synod, and even as delegates to the apostolic see, they may prohibit, ordain, reform, and establish not only the things aforesaid, but also whatsoever else shall seem to them to have relation hereunto and may compel the faithful people inviolably to observe them, by ecclesiastical censures and other penalties, which at their pleasure they may appoint any privileges, exemptions, appeals, and customs whatsoever, to the contrary notwithstanding. Decree on Reformation The same sacred and holy ecumenical and general synod of Trent, lawfully assembled in the Holy Ghost, the same legates of the apostolic see presiding therein, to the end that the business of reformation may be proceeded with, has thought good that the following things be ordained in the present session. Chapter 1. The canons relative to the life and property of conduct of clerics are renewed. There is nothing that continually instructs others unto piety and the service of God, more than the life and example of those who have dedicated themselves to the divine ministry. For as they are seen to be raised to a higher position, above the things of this world, others fix their eyes upon them as a mirror, and derive from them what they are to imitate. Wherefore, clerics called to have the Lord for their portion ought by all means so to regulate their whole life and conversation, as that in their dress, comportment, gait, discourse, and all things else, nothing appear but what is grave, regulated, and replete with religiousness, avoiding even slight faults, which in them would be most grievous, that so their actions may impress all with veneration. Whereas, therefore, the more useful and decorous these things are for the church of God, the more carefully also are they to be attended to. 
the holy synod ordains that those things which have been heretofore copiously and wholesomely enacted by sovereign pontiffs and sacred councils, relative to the life, propriety of conduct, dress, and learning of clerics, and also touching the luxuriousness, feastings, dances, gambling, sports, and all sorts of crime whatever, as also the secular employments to be by them shunned, the same shall be henceforth observed under the same penalties or greater, to be imposed at the discretion of the ordinary. Nor shall any appeal suspend the execution hereof, as relating to the correction of manners. But if anything of the above shall be found to have fallen into desuetude, they shall make it their care that it be brought again into use as soon as possible, and be accurately observed by all, any customs to the contrary notwithstanding, lest they themselves may have, God being the avenger, to pay the penalty deserved by their neglect of the correction of those subject to them. CHAPTER Two, WHO ARE TO BE PROMOTED TO CATHEDRAL CHURCHES Whosoever is hereafter to be promoted to a cathedral church shall not only be fully qualified by birth, age, morals, and life, and in other respects, as required by the sacred canons, but shall also have been previously constituted in sacred order, for the space of at least six months. And information on these points, if the individual be only recently or not at all known at the court of Rome, shall be derived from the legates of the apostolic see, or from the nuncios of the provinces, or from his ordinary, and in his default, from the nearest ordinaries. And besides the things above named, he shall possess such learning as to be able to discharge the obligations of the office that is about to be conferred upon him, and he shall, therefore, have been previously promoted by merit in some university for studies, to be a master or doctor or licentiate in sacred theology or in canon law, or shall be declared by the public testimony of some academy fit to teach others. And, if he be a regular, he shall have a similar attestation from the superiors of his own order, and all the above-named persons from whom the information or testimony aforesaid is to be derived shall be bound to report on these matters faithfully and gratuitously. Otherwise let them know that their consciences will be grievously burthened, and that God and their own superiors will punish them. CHAPTER three, Daily distributions out of the third part of all fruits soever are to be established on whom the portion of absentees devolves, certain cases excepted. Bishops, even as the delegates of the apostolic see, shall have power to divide the third part of any manner of fruits and proceeds of all dignities, personates, and offices existing in cathedral or collegiate churches, into distributions to be assigned as they shall judge fit, in such wise to wit, that if those who ought to receive them should fail on any appointed day, personally, to discharge the duty that devolves upon them, according to the form that shall be prescribed by the said bishops, they shall forfeit that day's distribution, and shall acquire no manner of property therein, but it shall be applied to the fabric of the church, as far as it may need it, or to some other pious place at the discretion of the ordinary. But if their contumacy increase, they shall proceed against them according to the constitution of the sacred canons. But if any of the aforesaid dignitaries has, neither by right nor custom, any jurisdiction, administration, or office devolving upon him in the cathedral or collegiate churches, but out of the city in the same diocese there is a cure of souls to be attended to, which he who holds that dignity is willing to take upon himself, in this case, during the time that he shall reside and minister in the church with that cure, he shall be considered as though he were present and assisted at the divine offices in those cathedral or collegiate churches. These things are to be understood as appointed for those churches only wherein there is no custom or statute whereby the said dignitaries who do not serve lose something, which amounts to the third part of the said fruits and proceeds. Any customs, even though immemorial, exemptions and constitutions, even though confirmed by oath or by any authority whatsoever to the contrary, notwithstanding. CHAPTER four. Those not initiated into a sacred order shall not have a voice in the chapter of any cathedral or collegiate church, the qualifications and duties of those who hold benefices therein. Whosoever being employed in the divine offices in a cathedral or collegiate, secular or regular church, is not constituted in the order of subdeaconship at least, shall not have a voice in the chapter of those churches, even though this may have been voluntarily conceded to him by the others 
as to those who possess or shall hereafter possess in the said churches any dignities, personates, offices, prebends, portions, and any other manner of benefices whatever, to which various obligations are annexed, such as that some shall say or sing mass, others the gospel, others the epistle, they shall be bound, all just impediment ceasing, to receive the requisite orders within a year, whatsoever may be their privilege, exemption, prerogative, or nobility of birth. Otherwise they shall incur the penalties enacted by the constitution of the Council of Vienne, which begins ut i qui, which by this present decree is renewed and the bishop shall compel them to exercise in person the aforesaid orders on the appointed days, and to discharge all the other duties required of them in the divine service, under the said penalties, and others even more grievous, which may be imposed at their discretion. Nor, for the future, shall any such office be assigned to any but those who shall be well known fully to have already the age and other qualifications, otherwise such provision shall be null. CHAPTER five. Dispensations expedited out of the Roman court shall be committed to the bishop, and be by him examined. Dispensations, by whatsoever authority they are to be granted, if they are to be consigned out of the Roman court, shall be consigned to the ordinaries of those who shall have obtained them. And as to those dispensations which shall be granted as graces, they shall not have effect until the said ordinaries, as delegates of the apostolic see, shall have first ascertained summarily only and extrajudicially that the terms of the petition do not labor under the vice of surreptition or abruption. Chapter 6. Last Intentions to be Altered with Caution. In alterations of last wills, which alterations ought not to be made except for a just and necessary cause, the bishops, as delegates of the apostolic see, shall, before the alterations aforesaid are carried into execution, ascertain that nothing has been stated in the prayer of the petition which suppresses what is true or suggests what is false. Chapter 7. The chapter Romana, in the sixth of the Decretals, is renewed. Apostolic legates and nuncios, patriarchs, primates, and metropolitans, in appeals interposed before them, shall, in all causes whatsoever, as well as in admitting the appeals, as in granting inhibitions after an appeal, be bound to observe the form and tenor of the sacred constitutions, and especially of the constitution of Innocent the Fourth, beginning Romana. Any custom, even though immemorial, or usage or privilege to the contrary notwithstanding, otherwise the inhibitions and proceedings, and all the consequences thereof, shall be ipso jure null. Chapter 8. Bishops shall execute the pious dispositions of all persons, shall visit all manner of pious places, if not under the immediate protection of kings. The bishops, even as the delegates of the apostolic see, shall, in the cases by law permitted, be the executors of all pious dispositions, whether made by last will, or between the living. They shall have a right to visit all manner of hospitals, colleges, and confraternities of laymen, even those which are called schools, or which go by any other name, but not, however, those places which are under the immediate protection of kings, except with their permission. Also the elemicinary institutions, called Mont de Piet, or of charity, and all pious places by whatsoever name designated, even though the aforesaid institutions be under the care of laymen, and though the said pious places be protected by a privilege of exemption, and by virtue of their office, they shall take cognizance of, and see to the performance, in accordance with the ordinances of the sacred canons, of all things that have been instituted for God's worship, for the salvation of souls, or for the support of the poor. Any custom, even though immemorial, or privilege, or statute whatsoever to the contrary notwithstanding. CHAPTER nine. Administrators of any pious places whatsoever shall give in their accounts to the ordinary, unless it be otherwise provided by the foundation. The administrators, whether ecclesiastical or lay, of the fabric of any church whatsoever, even though it be a cathedral, as also of any hospital, confraternity, charitable institution, called Mont de Piet, and of any pious places whatsoever, shall be bound to give in once a year an account of their administration to the ordinary, all customs and privileges to the contrary being set aside, unless it should happen that, in the institution and regulations of any church or fabric, it has been otherwise expressly provided. But if from custom or privilege or some regulation of the place their account has to be rendered to others deputed thereunto, in that case the ordinary shall also be employed jointly with them, and all acquittances given otherwise shall be of no avail to the said administrators. CHAPTER Ten. 
notaries shall be subject to the examination and judgment of the bishops. Whereas the unskillfulness of notaries causes very many injuries, and gives occasion to many lawsuits, the bishop, even as the delegate of the apostolic see, may, by actual examination, search into the competency of all notaries, even though created by apostolic, imperial, or royal authority, and if such notaries be found incompetent, or on any occasion guilty of a delinquency in the discharge of their office, he may forbid them, altogether or for a time, to exercise that office, in ecclesiastical and spiritual affairs, lawsuits and causes, nor shall any appeal on their part suspend the prohibition of the ordinary. Decree touching the petition for the concession of the chalice. Moreover, whereas the same sacred and holy synod in the preceding session reserved unto another time for an opportunity that might present itself, two articles to be examined and defined, which articles had been proposed on another occasion, but had not then been as yet discussed, to wit, whether the reasons by which the holy Catholic Church was led to communicate, under the one species of bread, laymen and also priests, when not celebrating, are in such wise to be adhered to, as that on no account is the use of the chalice to be allowed to any one soever, and whether in that case, for reasons beseeming and consonant with Christian charity, it appears that the use of the chalice is to be granted to any nation or kingdom, it is to be conceded under certain conditions, and what are those conditions? It has now, in its desire that the salvation of those on whose behalf the request is made, may be provided for in the best manner, decreed that the whole business be referred to our most holy Lord, as by this present decree it doth refer it, who, of his singular prudence, will do that which he shall judge useful for the Christian commonwealth, and salutary for those who ask for the use of the chalice. Indiction of the Next Session Moreover, this sacred and holy synod of Trent appoints for the day of the next session, the Thursday after the octave of all saints, which will be the twelfth day of the month of November, and thereon it will decree concerning the sacrament of order and the sacrament of matrimony, etc. The session was prorogued until the fifteenth day of July, 1563. End of Doctrine on the Sacrifice of the Mass Decree touching the petition for the concession of the chalice. Moreover, whereas the same sacred and holy synod in the preceding session reserved unto another time for an opportunity that might present itself, two articles to be examined and defined, which articles had been proposed on another occasion, but had not then been as yet discussed, to wit, whether the reasons by which the holy Catholic Church was led to communicate, under the one species of bread, laymen and also priests, when not celebrating, are in such wise to be adhered to, as that on no account is the use of the chalice to be allowed to any one soever, and whether in that case, for reasons beseeming and consonant with Christian charity, it appears that the use of the chalice is to be granted to any nation or kingdom, it is to be conceded under certain conditions, and what are those conditions? It has now, in its desire that the salvation of those on whose behalf the request is made, may be provided for in the best manner, decreed that the whole business be referred to our most holy Lord, as by this present decree it doth refer it, who, of his singular prudence, will do that which he shall judge useful for the Christian commonwealth, and salutary for those who ask for the use of the chalice. Indiction of the Next Session Moreover, this sacred and holy synod of Trent appoints for the day of the next session, the Thursday after the octave of all saints, which will be the twelfth day of the month of November, and thereon it will decree concerning the sacrament of order and the sacrament of matrimony, etc. The session was prorogued until the fifteenth day of July, 1563. End of Doctrine on the Sacrifice of the Mass